Okay. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the departmental seminar. I would request our director, Professor Tanushri Shahadas Gupta, to give a brief introduction for today's speaker. Uh, yeah, welcome to today's uh, departmental seminar. And uh, for a change, today we have an engineer as uh, our speaker. And uh, he's a civil engineer, uh, which is even more unusual. But he is currently in the mechanical engineering department in John Hopkins. Uh, he did his uh, BE from Shippur, which is now ISG. Was that time also no, ISG? That was, that was BE. So, uh, he did his B from there, then master's from oh. Kharagpur, and then went back to US for the PhD, but came back to again. at some point as a faculty. <laughs> in which department he was? I was in civil engineering. He was in civil engineering. From 2009 to 2019. So he is an engineer who is interested in materials and materials under extreme condition. He will explain what he means by extreme condition. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me at the back? You can come in the front. Okay, so what I'll be talking about today will be materials at extremes. Now, first of all, I need to explain as to what do I mean by extremes and then I'll be talking about like different types of materials that we have investigated and are interested in. So let's see what do we mean by extremes? I mean I've already given my introduction I mean Professor Dagrup has already given that so there's no need of introduction as such. Uh, one of the extreme conditions that we deal with is something called impact. Now okay an example of an impact by the way, please understand that, okay, I'm an engineer. So obviously all the things that comes in first is an application and then we kind of get built into the power itself. So one of the applications of impact is something like bullet projectile. Uh, what we do is typically, okay, make these kind of like uh, armors, so body armors, you say, and we have to kind of like reinforce it with different types of materials such that it can sustain different types of bullet impacts. Like let's say if I have a rifle impact, for example, or rifle bullets, in those cases, we have to kind of make this material something of like silicon carbide or boron carbide, some kind of carbide materials. If I'm, ha I'm talking about something like revolver type of bullets, then those things may be something like Kevlar or some other polymeric material. So it depends what type of uh, things that we're talking about. Anyway, we do kind of do simulations for these in order to see that, okay, how much amount of penetration we can get. I mean, which is obviously derogatory. We do not want to have that penetration anyway. So we are talking about those kind of materials. But apart from these, I should say, mundane activities, what we see in, in normal army uh, situations, we can also have impact in certain other conditions. One of the things that we did recently was something like this. I do not know how many of you are acquainted with something called DART mission. So DART mission happened sometimes in 26 September 2022. The mission was something, it was organized by NASA. And what it did is that it kind of launched a project, I mean, launched, a, I should say, a projectile. Think of this one as a projectile. This is a uh, missile or whatever you want to think of it. It kind of like collided into a, uh, a binary asteroid system. The objective of that, with the collision, it will kind of take out some mass. And as it takes out the mass, the orbital period or orbital, more, I mean, orbital sh I mean, uh, this path will change. If you change the orbital path, then that will prevent. Uh, it from hitting the Earth. So that's something called a planetary protection. So we have been uh, working on this problem for quite some time, did some kind of simulations at different levels in order to understand as to how the things are done. Note, the distance that we're talking about or hitting the target is something like 11 million kilometers away from the Earth. So it's something like that. You cannot see the thing, but still you can hit it. Anyway, so uh, we were, uh, okay, let's say at 27th July, we could see this kind of thing. Draco is, by the way, and I mean, a, a, a camera, which was done by the, uh, these uh, Italian agency. So this, this, this thing, this mission that was carried out by NASA was uh, 
co-funded by the ESA or European Space Agency, JAXA, Japanese Space Agency as well. So three, uh, three agencies kind of combined together in order to kind of do this mission. And Draco was actually one of the cameras which was in there. So Draco, and then there was another camera. I forgot his name, but anyway. So those two cameras were kind of recording the incident. And we were able to see as to how this asteroid kind of looked like at T minus 11, T means the time of impact, minus 11 seconds, T minus two seconds, and that, that was the impact. After that, we have done calculations about, okay, what is the orbital change in path and uh, so other things, and we got results as to what we wanted, or in fact, much more better than that. So what I'm trying to mean by that is that when you're talking about impact, we can have different types of situations. We can have something like mundane activities as what we're talking about is bullet projectiles. We can also have something like planetary protection, which are pretty much involved process. Now, what do we do for that, for example? I mean, we do something like continuum simulations. As you see, there is a projectile which is kind of hitting the target. So it's like a half, uh, half spherical you can think of, or half spherical plate. The projectile is kind of hitting it. And you will see some kind of like materials which are like ejected out of the entire thing. By the way, we are utilizing continuum simulations in here. Not MV, not DFT. Okay. Continuum simulations is entirely dependent upon differential equations, in which we, what we do is that we solve for uh, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. Uh, this is basically a simulation thing. What you see in here at the bottom of it is something like your, uh, these are experiments as to how it is done. So you see that there is, this is basically called a gas gun type of apparatus. You can load a projectile from here, and this projectile will kind of hit the target in here. And then these are your, uh, th this is the chamber actually where you're, where the target is being hit. And you can have like different types of diagnostics. We have something like, uh, let's say, uh, obviously camera. You see one of the camera movies in here, uh, uh, cameras, which are very high speed cameras. And apart from that, you can also do like spectroscopy. You can see okay, what different types of gases are emitting. Uh, you can also do something like, uh, uh, like, what is it called? An X-ray, flash X-ray type of things in which you can see as to how the projectile kind of in, infiltrates within the target, and so on and so forth. So these these type of experiments are done in order to kind of understand much more about like ballistic impact uh, for development of body armor and other things. Show you a small movie as to by the way this one was recorded in something like 100, 100 million frames per second. You see you have seen a projectile kind of hitting this thing. And this is the ejector cloud which kind of comes out. Okay. So how it is kind of, uh, and we can track each and every uh, particles which are kind of getting emitted. What is the shape of the project? I mean, what are the shape of those things? How, what is the velocity, direction? Name. The right is penetrating more than whatever is on the right. Let me play it again. So this one, this one is the projectile. Right yeah. So oh, this one is the projectile. That's still there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. By the way, uh, these type of events are not only applicable in the case of uh, your, what to say, the year environment. We also do uh, see some kind of events which are happens in real. I do not know how many of you have uh, have been on a on a ship, but if you are talking about ship, something like this, I have not played the entire movie. But if you are uh, moving in a ship which is in C state five, then you are seeing this kind of situations. You can see, understand, you can think of like, let's say, what is the hull experiencing? This is called a marine hull. And this hull is experiencing significant amount of impact from the, the water. This is called actually a greenhouse, I mean, sorry, not a greenhouse, green water effect. And this green water effect can be really disastrous for the case of ship hulls, marine ship hulls. So when we're talking about like engineering applications, when we kind of design it kind of material in here, we have to think about like, okay, whether can it sustain this much amount of pressure and the frequency by which it is getting loaded up uh, such that the ship that is in there is safe. By the way, uh, I you will see in my talk that uh, many of my uh, many of my researches has been oriented towards something like water. Uh, just to make a note, my master's degree was not in civil engineering; it was in ocean engineering. So I've kind of like dribbled around <laughs> all the way. So since it was in ocean engineering, the water is actually one of the component of my research. It has been. Over for a long time. Anyway, another extreme condition that we're talking about is something like shock waves. Now, shock waves can originate if, I, if you have a projectile, it cannot be past a target, and it will create a shock wave within the material. So, let's see as to what we have done with regards to shock waves. One of the applications of the shock waves is something like this. This is, this is done in typically in, in 
to study something like brain traumatic injury. If there is an explosion in there, then what you have seen in many of the Bollywood movies, you might have seen that, okay, the people is flying around, right? Now, if the people is flying around, that's nice to observe, but un understand that there are a significant amount of damage that is getting on the lungs as well as the brain. So how the kind of brain, brain is getting affected by these things is some, some part what we have done work on a little bit. Uh, shockwave loadings can, as I again, uh, considering the case of water, if you're talking about like explosions, instead of having air explosion, we can have underwater explosion. And the case of underwater explosion is much more complicated because the thing is, you don't only have like shockwaves which kind of traveling in, but also you have like cavitation regions. And this cavitation and shockwaves, they kind of combine together and create a very interesting physics. At the end of the day, you will not be able to see any of these things. What you see is basically the stream of water. So what we have done as part of our study, later on I will be presenting in here itself, you'll see as to how the shockwave kind of I mean, transmits through the water and what are the different types of mechanisms by which it does. There's also reflection and transmission and all of the kind of things. Just last example for the case of shockwaves, not all of them are devastating as you see in here. You can have something like, let's say Concord type of flights. If you're having a flight more than that of Mach 1, you can develop something like your shockwaves at the behind of it. And how the shockwave kind of interacts with the aerodynamics of the plane matters or matters in designing as to how the surface of the plane should be. You can, you can. Yes, you can, you can use shockwaves in order to uh, do it for defensive as well as offensive. Uh, shockwaves are also utilized for yeah, when so you're using this actually i mean now uh, right now the research i mean there is a very hot topic research that is kind of getting into this field is called like hypersonic research so the hypersonic research what it does is basically uh, think of like okay you are uh, trying to uh, shoot a arm uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles mm -hmm. so that will travel let's say a distance from i don't know maybe like from here to DC or DC to Moscow, something around that range. And that should be within like 10, 10 mi minutes. So if I'm traveling that much amount of distance in 10 minutes, we are talking about like Mark speeds in the range of like Mark 15, Mark 30 around that range. So if I'm talking about those ranges, then we need to think about like, okay, what are the type of materials that you can sustain those high uh, temperatures that are getting that are getting created with those due to those Mark waves. Same thing happens in the case of like space wind vehicles. So we have to kind of design it properly such that not only the material but also the, the dynamics model. Anyway, so what we have done with regards to shockwave experimentation, this one this one was some kind of experimentation which we have done at Visakhapatnam NSTL. So what we have done is basically we have taken something like these are called like sandwich composite panels. You might have seen the ship before, right? The the hull of the ship. So those are made out of these materials. So yeah, it has like glass fiber on the top of it. In between there is a PVC foam core. So in here, and then again, another glass fiber. So it's like two glass fibers, and then you have a PVC foam core. The advantage of this foam core is that if there is any kind of like impact on this thing, the foam cores will deflect and will kind of absorb the energy. Okay. And in fact, these are these have proven to be much better than that of your steel uh, hulls. By the way, uh, so what we did in here is that we created some, uh, we took some plastic stoves, like PBX, uh, materials and then we kind of charge this PBS materials below the below this uh, this this thing uh, this your plate sandwich plate we immerse it in the water subject to the blast and then we were able to kind of record as to what is the pressure pulse that is kind of going to create we did see something like a dense in here and how the dense kind of like evolve along with time how the dense are getting created so those were the observations that we have been putting in. the objective being to create better type of ship house for utilizing this Experiments of shockwaves are also done at uh, some other places. We have utilized this facility also, that's in ISC. If you go to aerospace department, you will see this facility in here. So what this one is that, okay, you have your safety tank and you can put up any samples in here and then you can load the shockwaves. You can put in different, uh, I mean, usually measured in terms of bars. You can go up to like 100 PSI, if I remember correctly. So you can go up to those ranges and then see as to what the effect of the shockwave does on that particular material. I'll come to the aspect of the material and what it does to the material later on, but I'm just talking about like okay, what are the shockwave experiments are and what is done at, at those levels. By the way, this one is something like your traditional uh, like horizontal shockwaves. 
we have it at Berkeley itself, and there are many other institutions which does have this shockwaves. How can you generate the waves? Okay, so there are like two chambers in here. There is a driver, cham uh, driver chamber and a driven chamber, and that is separated by a diaphragm. So you kind of first load it up uh, with some kind of uh, gas. It depends upon, uh, depending upon the type of gas that you have in here, and depending upon the bore, you can kind of control the pressure. So once you kind of load it up, then this diaphragm will kind of rupture at certain point, and that will kind of that, that will initiate the shock. Yes. Actually, there is also another technology which is done, and that is present in ISC, but not anywhere else which I've seen. They have something like uh, uh, what you say, Russian type of pistons. So that can kind of, uh, and the certain pressure, these pistons can open up, and then they can close. Them. Them. Yes, exactly. This is uh, what you uh, what you can see in kind of like any shockwave experiments. This is how what we measure, like how the shockwave is kind of propagating. As you will see, there is a projectile which kind of fits in here, and you can see the shockwave is kind of getting generated. This is just for demonstration, nothing else. Okay, let's move on. So, when we talk about shock physics, uh, we can attack the problem in many different ways. The first uh, thing is like talking about continuum studies, and then we we'll go into like NB as well as DFT type of things. So when we talk about like continuum studies, uh, this one was done actually by my uh, PhD student Riti. So what we did is something like that. We took a plate in here, and this was your nonlinear compressible water. By the way, you might be thinking about like, okay, is water non-compressible? Nonlinear compressible? Yes, please. We will show you that later. So when you have these uh, shockwaves kind of hitting it, the shockwave pulse can be like your this kind of thing or kind of exponential type of stuff. So as it hits the plate, this is a rigid plate, it does not deform. So you can have a constant back pressure or a, I mean variable back pressure in which the pressure can vary. And depending upon that, you have to utilize this set of equations. These are nothing. These are nothing but conservation of mass, as you can see in here. This is a, this continuous form of conservation of mass. So that's why it is called rankine hubbard jump conditions. And there is a continuum of uh, con I mean, uh, conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. Apart from that, you require something like your material parameters. So in this case, since it is a medium, like let's say water or any other medium, we are utilizing a meagerness in equation of state. So that means we are relating the pressure with that, the temperature and other things. So utilizing those things, we eventually form, framed our own theory. I mean, we did simulations as well as our theory and then compared it with the ones which are existing in there. And then we kind of got like good matches. We also did something like oblique impact. So if you are having the shock waves, which kind of instead of impacting it at a normal angle, if it impacts at an oblique angle, then what happens? Many times, if, you, if it impacts at oblique angles, it will not generate a shock wave at all. You can generate something like something called a max stem. So this is what you see as a max stem. And we can we have uh, at least for the case of water, uh, we can show that okay, at different types of wedge angles and different types of uh, inclusion velocities. I mean, how the incident. Uh, reflected pressure incident and the reflected pressures are. By the way, this IP over II, what it means is basically the impulse transmitted to the plate divided by the incident impulse. This is a blue structure interaction. Okay, now apart from that, so this one was what I showed you was something like your continuum studies. Now we are getting down into like molecular dynamics type of studies. So this is something like uh, what we have done for water. If you take like bulk liquid water and then you shock it, it has been reported in many literatures, primarily Russian literatures as well as some American literatures before. Uh, what you get is that you get you get something like called I7 phase. Now this I7 phase is something like this. What you are talking about is something like this. If this is a PT diagram for the other water. This is your liquid water where we exist. Yes. I'll talk about that. I'll, I'm talking about that in here. When you are under the severe amount of shock. Yes. Uh, no. I mean, uh, when we are okay, the the you pressure know, the that we are. The different models differ mostly with the polarization. Yes. Yes. Treating the polarizer. Yes. <clears throat> so when it is under this extreme shock, is there anything specific to it? There, there is nothing out there in the literature. So what we do is that we take the what is what is available, the ambient conditions, and then try to match it with whatever we can get from the experimental results. If it matches well, then we say that okay, this type of interactive condition is good to use for. It. So what we are doing in here is that we are taking like liquid water, bulk liquid water in here. 
And then we're kind of like jumping from this state to the I7 phase in here. By the way, this I7 phase is actually the densest form of water, like 1.77 gram per cc. And uh, I7 phase has been reported in shock experiments, but it also exists in uh, static compression. So if you look into like, uh, let's say the planetary, you go to like Uranus or Neptune or some other regions, and you look into the, uh, the, the crust of those regions, like if you go deep down into this Uranus and Neptune, you will see that they are filled up with like I7 type of stuff rather than molten iron. And as a matter of fact, people also predict that this I7 can also give you something like your uh, these uh, gravity, some form of gravity and other things. Now, those things I have not dealt with, so I cannot say much about it. But I7 is one of the densest phase that we know. And what we are, what I'm showing you in here is basically like, okay, if you take the case of water, water will have like different types of phases or rather I mean, in the vibration spectra. Now, these two phases are pretty well known. I should not say phase, I mean, I should say the spectra, the vibrational spectra. If you look into the centimeter inverse, like, okay, around like 1600 and around like 3460, around that range, you get you get response from the IR spectra. And you can say that, okay, this one, this one is your stretching and the, uh, the symmetric motion of those things, right? But apart from that, you can also get some phases which are below, I mean, in the terahertz range. So in the terahertz range, you can get something like that of I mean, hydrogen bonding. So these hydrogen bonding, modes you can have one thing for your flexure and other one for your stretching so you can have the stretching in between the two things and then the flexure in between the two things and those kind of like originate in here by the way the one dots i mean the, the straight lines in the black they are basically experimental results no no this is just for bulk water just for bulk water and these two are your liberation modes so what we do is that before selecting any kind of interatomic potential we first try out the interatomic potentials and see the which one is the matching the, the vibration spectrum much more accurately. That's still the bulk water. That's still the bulk water. The no, it's done nothing to do with the shock, but then we kind of, okay, for the shock, I'll come. So once we kind of like select this one, then what we do for the shock is something like this. In shock, what is typically done is that we have to do something like shock velocity versus particle velocity relationship. <clears throat> or in other words, USCP relationship is what is typically done. Now, there are a lot of experiments in there. And what we do is that utilizing these potentials, we see that, okay, whether can we match this USCP relationship? If we can match this USCP relationship, then we say that, okay, the interlink potential that we have chosen is quite good enough for similar to these conditions. <coughs> yes. Yes. Are you also considering the time scale of the, how do you modulate the time scale of the shock? Sure. Extreme both pressure and temperature, both. Temperature and extreme uh, short time scales. Mm -hmm. Both of these things have to be uh, yes. incorporated. How yes. are you dealing with the short time scales? Uh, well, I mean, what we do in these cases is that, I mean, these, I mean, if you have to think about like strain rates. Now, in these cases, the strain rates are in the order of like 10 to the power minus 6, 10 to the power minus 7, around that range. So that we can simulate easily with molecular dynamics. Sure. If you are talking about like, uh, let's say, uniaxial type of loading, like, let's say, uh, a, like, your, like your, let's say, a bar, which is kind of getting loaded. That we cannot do with molecular dynamics easily because that will require much more larger time scales. Okay, but are you so so from the perspective of simulation, is this uh, shock wave being uh, modeled as a static strain gradient as well? Static in time? What do you mean static in time? I mean, uh, think of it like this like, okay, you have like um, to, to explain very shortly, like let's say you have the set of molecules mm -hmm. and these molecules are given a certain velocity. I see. As it kind of like travels through, then that will kind of create some kind of like defects and other things within the entire molecule, I mean, entire set. So that's what we're measuring. So you see, select some certain molecules and give them some velocity. Some velocity. Respect to the other ones. Yes. That is your model of your Yes. Topic. Yes. So that, that that's like one way. I mean, there are like a couple of different other ways, but that's the most basic thing. So what we were kind of doing in that is that, okay, as I said, uh, in order to do any kind of like shock experiment, the first thing that you have to do is that you have to kind of match it with the USCP relationship, which is provided by the uh, experiments. And there is a nice uh, literature out there by Marsh and Carter, who has done almost on any material that you that you're available with, you can have the shock wave data of that. So first of all, you can match that, and then you can proceed with other things. With that, what we are seeing is that we were seeing something like this. Uh, if you look into the RDF, or basically the radial distribution function for oxygen oxygen, we can see this kind of notch. And this notch kind of represents that, okay, you are moving from the, I mean, the 
basic uh, water phase, the bulk water phase 2007. Much more literature are in there. I will come to that later on. But this is one of the um, predominant things by which you can identify that, okay, you have a phase transformation going on. After that, what we were looking into that is that we were seeing that, okay, if you're talking about, we are, we are actually crossing this boundary here. Now at this boundary level, is it entirely a I7 type of phase, meaning that, okay, uh, the, the nucleus is oriented at certain points within the I7 crystal structure? Well, what we did see is that we got something like your plastic eyes, meaning that, okay, the nucleus is oriented at certain points within that VCC structure of I7, but your hydrogen molecules are rotating around. And because of the hydrogen molecules rotating around, you can see the rotational diffusion for those things are significantly different from that of I7. So with that, we, we could justify the fact that, okay, the, the water that you're getting in here um, after shock, um, after shock inducing, we can get something like what is called a plastic phase of ice, which is happening in between this ice seven and the liquid water. We also did something like uh, shock uh, for the case of air. Now in the case of air at a continuum level, we have to think about like, okay, what equation of state we are using. The equation of state that we're using, typically people use is called an ideal gas equation of state. Now ideal gas equation of state is not valid, for many different situations, especially at like high temperature and high pressure. So what we utilize in here is called a Van der Waals equation of state. And in this Van der Waals equation of state, you see that we are, we are taking the energy contribution from many, many different aspects. Translation, rotation, these are of the molecules, vibration, electronic contributions, and dissociation and ionization. This ionization equation is actually taken from this uh, Shaha equation or Mignan Shaha equation. So there is a modified version of the Mignan Shaha equation by through which we can take this ionization potential. Anyway, all of these things are kind of taken together and utilizing these things, we can <coughs> relate uh, what we are, I mean, uh, I mean, relate as to where your, I mean, this peak overpressure and I mean, which point we should be taking this ideal gas equation of state, which point we should be taking the vibrational uh, degrees of freedom and other things. So let, let's say if I'm taking this PS over P0 is basically the peak overpressure. So if I'm exceeding like 10 to the power one, then we should be talking about something like, or rather 10 to the power seven or so, we should be talking about something like vibrational equation of state should be considered. Vibrational part of the degrees of freedom in the year, that should be considered. But still, if you notice this thing, this does not consider anything about like uh, chemistry, which is in there, or basically creation of new species. If I take like creation of new species, what we have to do is something like this. We take a kind of mixture of different types of gases in there carbon dioxide, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on and so forth. And then we subject to shock waves. And eventually, we can see that there are some creation of new species, like let's say, one of the examples I've shown for nitrous oxide, there are other species which can be excreted. And you can see like, okay, all of these points are like, okay, entire shock wave, and then let's say that this is the particle velocity, like 2.5 kilometers per second, we take like one point in which we are seeing that no NO molecules is created. It is getting created, by, let's say, so if you have a shock wave at like 4.5 km per second, you can generate this type of new molecules. Now, what we want to do later on is that if I have these new molecules getting created, we can add in to the scalar equation of state and we can modify something in order to kind of provide uh, an equation of state model for that outcome. Yeah. Yes, there is experimental evidence and actually, the, I mean, I've not, I mean, this data that you see in here, it says that, okay, if you have a peak over pressure uh, of, peak of pressure can go up to something like 20 or so. So we are kind of reaching the CR means reflected pressure over incident pressure. We can go up to like 16 or around that range. So maybe we are not considering the uh, effect of these chemical reactions. So that's why we are not able to go down to that pressure. But if you take only the ideal gas equation of state, you can only go up to the CR value of around that cell. Uh, people have done experiments at around like 1940s in order to kind of show that, okay, what is the CR value? And those are actually pretty, I mean, many of you must have seen Oppenheimer. So in those, prior to doing this kind of test, they have done these kind of uh, experimental tests and those are reports out there. Okay, now let's talk about for other materials. One of the materials that we talked about uh, or what, we're, what we have been doing is something like, let's say, SCC copper. So if you project a shock wave in copper, then you can get significant type of dislocation motions in there. 
And these dislocation motions, you can have different types of uh, heart block manipulation, shock trigger, I mean, different types of front period and all of the different types of dislocation mo I mean, motions can initiate. And these can also create something like twin plates. Those are pretty much well known in literature. They are reported. And what we have done is basically created those numerical simulations in order to kind of match it with that, whatever is there in the study. But one interesting thing that we have observed. Yes, modified yield. What we have observed, interestingly, is that we can get also a shock, uh, a shock induced phase transition in these type of materials. We, first of all, did our MB simulations. We, we got that. Then we kind of did a DFT MB type of simulations. We also got the same thing. And then we were kind of like saying that, okay, whether it is really feasible, because many times it has been reported that your EM potentials or modified EM potentials not get that great enough. So we kind of took the, uh, the structure that we obtained at this particular temperature and pressure, which was around like 80 GPA and around what, uh, 1130 or something around the temperature, Kelvin temperature. And then we ran some kind of like DFT simulations in there. And what we see is that if you if you run a energy as by CIA, CIA ratio, you will see that the okay, FCC is the lowest phase, obviously. But <clears throat> the difference in between, B, I mean, this BCT phase and the FCC phase is something around like 2.9.8 million volts. So we cannot run a finite temperature DFT, obviously. So that's why what we did is that we kind of computed the Hemorrhage phase energy at the constant volume, and then also the Gibbs phase energy at the constant pressure. And from that, we were able to sh show that okay, at around temperature around like one around like 1100 or so, and a temp, I mean pressure of like 80 GPA, we can get a phase which is similar to that of BCC type of phase, which is being predicted from the MBC simulations or AI simulations. <coughs> but if we do that, we show yes, we did have an issue in here, but still we were not confident that okay, whether that 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 issue is kind of giving you the correct results. Because even if you think about like Avenicio, then uh, we are thinking about like, okay, everything is going to depend upon the density at the ground state. Now, whether at that temperature and pressure, the ground state is really applicable? Don't know. <coughs> As you can see in here, if I'm talking about the FCC at the BCT phase, uh, this one has like less amount of holes. So since it has less amount of holes, obviously that means it will have like larger amount of thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity. I don't know what, what type of application that can come out from here. But this is one of the observations. And interestingly enough, like actually the last year, uh, there was an experimental study which did prove that yes, there is a uh, this BCT so, type uh, of transmission. Remember correctly, FCC to BCC, there's some kind of a drain part. Yes, that, that's actually Martin City transformation yeah, which happens. Yeah. But uh, this one does not actually really follow the Martin City transformation. There are like a couple of different parts, Martin yes. City transformation parts. Yes. This one really does not follow the entire Martin City in a proper way. It follows a different path. So we discussed as to what path it kind of takes uh, when it kind of like moves from this FCC to that kind of BCT type of structure. Uh, last year or uh, the year before last, around like 2020, 21, around that time. Did you actually uh, <clears throat> detail the path? Yes, we also detailed the path. So as, as I was mentioning, the last year or so, there was a group from Washington State University who took a polycrystal of copper and they shock loaded that and they were able to observe this BCT type. Of, they did not say BCT, they say actually like BCC type of phase, they were saying. What is the difference? BCC and BCT, they are very close. They are very close. And actually, I mean, if you if you look into like copper, uh, this BCC and BCT phase, you can get, uh, not with shock, I mean, in literature, if you find out, you will see, if you do like molecular DNA detection, you can grow this BCC type of phase. If you, if you deposit, like, let's say, copper on something like platinum or other things, you can get. Yes, this is the What's the So that is. Okay. Uh, at Hopkins, we have something like your laser microfluorite experiments, which are something like this. So we have your pulse energy. Uh, and then with the pulse energy, we kind of like, um, basically you can think of like this, you're kind of like ablating a region in here and this kind of travels a certain velocity, it hits the target and you have your uh, your PDV or basically photon Doppler velocity at the back end of it. And you can measure that, okay, what is the velocity, what is the displacement and so on and so forth. So that is system is in there and we utilize that for many different applications. One example is something like this, I'll show you one. 
So what you're seeing is at the back end of this thing. So at the back end of the target. So once it is the impactor kind of hits the target, this is how it kind of plays. And uh, you can actually do like any type of samples, but the, 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 the speeds that we're talking about is not very high. We can go up to only like, let's say one kilometer per second in these kind of situations. Yeah, I always wonder, for instance, if you see the wave front, right? How are these uh, made visible in this fast camera? Sure. You, you, you have to kind of put a medium such that these mediums, kind of, as the shock kind of moves, then that will kind of create a uh, wave path. And then you have to use the steering imaging. With the steering imaging, you can get that kind of path. So, this steering imaging is. Uh, I've seen pictures. These are like, they can photograph the current over the candles. Is yes. That what you're talking yes. About? Yes. Air current over the. Okay. Uh, shock can induce slaughter things. As we showed you, it can induce something like phase transformation, plasticity, and many other things. But it can also induce something like dissociation in polymers. Like let's say we are talking about the polymer molecule, and this polymer molecule is basically this PVC molecule. I kind of described when we were talking about this. Uh, naval ships, right? We have these PVC foam layers. And these PVC foam layers are made out of these kind of molecules, like the PVC foam. And if I have this kind of molecule, if I subject it to shock, which is this obviously is, then in that case, is you can have something like shock in this bond dissociation. By bond dissociation, I mean covalent bond dissociation. So what you can see in here is that, OK, at different shock velocities, you can have like, OK, which of the bonds are kind of like break? It depends upon, OK, what the activation energy of those particular bonds are, right? How much energy that you're giving in the shock? and how much energy is kind of being taken up by these bonds due to which it kind of eventually breaks. Uh, what I'm kind of showing in, he in here is uh, many of the MD simulations, MD simulations, unless until you are going to like reactive systems, we generally do not get any bond breaking. But if you do something like DFT and D type of things, then you can do something like bond breaking type of sim simulations. And that's what we are doing in here. So what I'm saying is that, okay, up to this particular uh, density or up to this particular like shock velocity, your both your MD simulations and DFT simulations are good enough. <clears throat> but if you go beyond that, you have to utilize DFT simulations in which, or DFT MD type of simulations in which you can actually see as to how the bond breaking is going to happen. We also did something on like polymers, means let's say epoxy resin. This resin is, this material is pretty common. And this resin material, if you have, uh, the, the, In one way, this resin material is kind of much more complicated because when you're talking about this type of polymers, you're talking about a thermoset polymer. Thermoset polymer, what it behaves is kind of like undergoes cross link. Basically, it undergoes chemical reaction in order to kind of form the bonds. Prior to that, I mean, if I'm talking about this one, that's a you know, that's a thermoplastic type of polymer, which is like your chain and that kind of like I mean, unpars or pars in itself. In this in these cases, you're talking about network of things. So that's like much more complicated. Anyway. So what we were looking in here is that apart from the breakage of these covalent bonds, they're also kind of breaking of the non-covalent bonds, or meaning that hydrogen bond just kind of gets created in here, or even the Van der Waals bonds. Now, how do these Van der Waals bonds or the hydrogen bonds kind of gets broken uh, when you're putting under shock waves or when you're putting it in any kind of like loading conditions? That's what we were observing. The objective, I mean, you might be thinking, okay, what is the objective of that? The objective is that, okay, if I can understand like which of the bonds are going to break first, then we can I can protect those bonds by some kind of like functional action. I do a functional action, then I can make those bonds much more stronger and so on. So, but don't you want the bonds to break? It depends. It depends. Now, in some applications, I do want the bonds to break in order to absorb the energy. In some cases, I do not want the bonds to break. I I want to kind of like display it. Uh, we have also done something like extreme high strain loading on those materials. By the way, the difference between high strain loading and the shock wave loading is that in shock. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the PP diagram, you're kind of like moving at a quarter degree. So that means you're increasing the temperature and the pressure simultaneously in the case of shock. In the case of high strain loading, just the extreme high strain, you're just applying the temperature or just applying the pressure. So you're not taking both of the things together. So if you look at the PT diagram, you're just moving straight up or in the vertical direction. No, I'm sorry, in the horizontal direction. That's it. So with that, Let's think about a polypropylene molecule. Polypropylene is very common. You can see it in your clothes or anything else. And if you take that molecule and then kind of like stretch it, 
So if you stretch the thing, then I mean, you will see that these different types of bonds they will kind of play a role with okay how the kind of uh, the global stress strain response of the entire polymer is. So that's what we're trying to relate the bond characteristics with that of the stress strain characteristic, global stress strain characteristics of the entire molecule here. We have also done it for like other molecules, like let's say one of them being polyurea. Polyurea molecule is pretty much utilized in for your uh, dissipation of shocks and other things. So we have seen it to this molecule, and then we were looking at the entanglement ratio, bond stretch, and a lot of other different things for that bond. And at the end of the day, it's basically relationship of the bond response to that of the global stress strain response. That's what we're looking Okay, we have also done some, some work on the minerals, and those minerals are typically applicable for any kind of geophysics applications. Like, let's say, if, I, if you take, for example, calcium sulfate, uh, calcium sulfate is an interesting type of material. Calcium sulfate is basically okay, gypsum. So, in gypsum, you have these calcium sulfate layers, and then you have the water layers. Now, these water layers, what we have seen is that if you take out the water layer, you can actually, these water layers actually hydrogen bond to each other. And uh, there are also something like metal ligand bonds in between the two things. If you heat the water, I mean, if you heat this thing at around like 300 or 300 centigrade, you will see that this water layer you can get rid of this water layer. And as you can get rid of the water layer, it becomes something called an anhydride. Now, the, the properties of the mechanical properties as well as the thermal properties of the anhydride is significantly different from that of the gypsum. So, what we are observing in here is that, okay, what is the role of this interlayer water, which kind of plays a role in your thermomechanical response of the minerals? Now, not only for gypsum, these, these type of water systems are present in other type of uh, other type of minerals as well, like let's say calcium silicate hydrates. Uh, you have in calcium aluminum silicate or like uh, ettrine jack type of systems, Portland diet, any other different systems. So we, what we did is that we we saw that okay, if I take those systems and then apply like let's say uniaxial tension loading or let's say uniaxial attraction tension loading, compression loading, and other all different things, then how the, what is the uh, global stress strain response and how the global stress strain response we can relate it to that of the information at the, the bond level. Please just, you know, exactly where the water yes, the because you, you can get the CIF files of these, of these minerals. The yes, the entire structure, they, they, they have done like NMR in order to kind of find out the entire structure. And with those entire structures, we, can, we start from there. Uh, pressure application. So one of those is obviously high pressure. That is a applicable thing for your uh, geophysics applications. So we are talking about like okay, what happens? I mean, I've not shown anything in here, but we have also looked into like okay, there are different types of minerals which are present in here, and at those pressures, you have like significant amount of pressure. Like how do the properties can change? So apparently, like the GFP type of simulation in order to kind of find out the missing properties. From an experimental viewpoint, you might be knowing that we typically look at the back. In order to kind of get those pressures. Uh, one of those things, just to show you an example, one of those things what we did is for silicon. So we, we know the silicon structure is something like this, a cubic diamond type of structure. As you apply the pressure, this is actually reported experimentally. Okay. So this path, like, okay, as you apply the pressure, it kind of undergoes different types of solid phase transformations. Now, what we did is that we did basically MB type of simulations, and even with the MB simulations, we were, we were able to do the XRD type of things. From the XRD, we can, uh, I mean, numerical XRD, I should say. Uh, from those, we can say that, okay, which of those phases correspond to your beta team, which of those phases corresponds to EMA, and so on and so forth. So basically, we kind of showed the pathway that is being exported, that is being reported experimentally. Huh? Yes. That was a class. Yeah, that's the class. Yes. <clears throat> The next thing that we, the last thing actually we'll be coming into is something like chemical reactions. Now, chemical reactions, as you might be knowing, is something like this. One of these uh, you must have passed through many of the bridges around, and you might have seen this kind of thing. It's not a nice, nice cycling, and that is also dangerous in one way. What happens in these cases is that okay, let's say if you have a saline water that can react with concrete and that kind of degrades the concrete. The question is, how can you protect these concrete structures against this alkaline type of imbalance? So, in order to uh, do that, we have to do like basically quantum chemistry, which I'll be talking about a little bit uh, in these kind of situations in order to see as to what is the type of corrosion that kind of happens in here. Apart from the bad point of it, there is also a good aspect of it. If you think about the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we have recently started working on something like artificial photosynthesis. This is a very well known technology in which you are creating the site to hold pairs. 
when you're creating these exciting hole pairs, then these, these exciting holes, they can actually uh, react with water or basically ionize water and create like radicals, O, o radicals, right? And these O radicals can react with, let's say, carbon dioxide or any other kind of like uh, molecules, and it can create some other kind of organic type of things that is being done for the case of your uh, plants. But we can, we do have these type of, min I mean, materials, which can, uh, which can work under IR, which can work under UV, which can work under visible light, you know, to kind of generate the same things. Now, if I can take these mineral, I mean, materials and then mix it with your infrastructure materials, we can produce something like, let's say, we can create an artificial photosynthesis by which it will absorb many of these harmful greenhouse gases. So that's the goal. We will see as to where we can go out of that. Uh, this mineral, so one of the examples, very common materials is basically titanium, PIO, that can work in the your UV type of range. But there are materials out there which are like polymeric materials, which can work in the invisible as well. Okay, so what we have done with like uh, cement, I mean, this uh, chemistry applications is something like this. We are, we are taking is something like cement hydration. We were interested in understanding as to how you have the powder of cement put in water and eventually it becomes like a rock solid. So how did that happen? What we did figure out is that uh, it undergoes some kind of like chemical, okay, before that. Uh, so before that, before that, let let me talk about what are the ingredients which are present in the cement. Now, the ingredients which are present in the cement is this is called C3S. C3S is not like carbon and sulfur. This is basically tricalcium silicate. So C stands for calcium, and S stands for silicate. So tricalcium silicate. Similarly, in here, dicalcium silicate. So what we are doing in here is that we are cutting like different surfaces of those dicalcium silicate and tricalcium silicates, and then we were seeing as what is the reactivity of those things, chemical reactions. By chemical reactivity, we were doing find, finding out what's the Foucault functions, and we're finding out what electrophilicity, electrophilicity of those things, and then how do they kind of like attract water? So we are putting in water in there, and then we are finding out the absorption energies. We're also doing something like video step of calculation in order to see like which of those orbitals are kind of influential enough in order to do this absorption process. Now, the chemical reaction that kind of ensues, I and mean, this one is initially how it kind of attracts the water. Now, the next thing is the chemical reaction. So chemical reaction is something like this. So we are talking about like tricalcium silicate reaction with water. H is the water. That kind of creates calcium silicate hydrate and calcium hydroxide. Now, in this entire process, if you look into the silicate molecule, this silicate molecule creates something like oligomers of silicates. Or this is what you have, this silicate oligomers. And these silicate oligomers are like long chains of silicates. And that actually kind of creates gives you the strength that is present within the concrete. So now we were thinking about like, okay, how to understand this oligomerization process. I mean, basically you have this mono, monomer of silicate and how to trace like oligomer of silicate. So we went through the entire reaction pathway of those things. And then we were seeing that, okay, what are the different type of pathways like okay, condensation, stereo mutation, and many other different aspects of it. We'll not go in much details about it. But anyway. Do you know the intermediates? Huh? Do you know the intermediates from no, we did not, we don't know, know the intermediates before. So we kind of like did our calculations and did this IRC in order to kind of find out okay, uh, whether it is fine or not. And that's how we kind of proceed. Because any transition path, we have like one negative item. Right? So with that, we're able to kind of calculate all those things. So you use transition space? Yes, we use transition space. Now. Another application which we have done recently, this is also a civil engineering application, by the way. I do not know about in here, at least not in Kolkata, but if you go to like, let's say, Minnapur area and other things, you will see red soil. Less, red soil is this latter soil. Now, what happens in those soils is that if you put in water, it kind of like swells up, it absorbs water, and during the dry season, it kind of dries up. Now, that's why if you go to Kharagpur, you will see most of the buildings in there, even though they're like one story building, they kind of like crack. They develop an entirely a very big crack. But if it's a seven story building, nothing happens. Now, what happens in that case is that in your, your building, which is lying on one surface, due to this uh, differential swelling and this uh, drying of the clay, it kind of like undergoes a differential sediment. Because of the differential sediment, you do develop these cracks, and due to which the building kind of has to be given up after a few years of time. So the question is, how what happens to the sort of the swelling so of this? Doesn't happen for the fibrosis. Because you have like significant amount of load in those cases with mean, the ground. Already yes. Already. So, uh, and, and, and your soil is not able to kind of lift up your building in one way. So anyway, so we were kind of looking into those type of, I mean, these soils and these uh, clays, and these clays are basically aluminous silicate type of materials. So we were looking for like, okay, 
if I take an aluminum silicate type of material, so which is called a Montmorillonite, by the way, it's called, in this case, we took something like metal cation induced Montmorillonite, so Montmorillonite is calcium aluminum silicate. So we took this aluminum silicate and put in different types of metal ions that is usually done. So if you put in different types of metal ions, and then we were seeing what type of bonds it kind of creates. What we did observe is that if you take in like, let's say potassium, for example, if you charge it, if you charge your soil with like potassium hydroxide, for example, you will kind of like get rid of this phenomenon. So that was our observation. We did not have the time to test it before that I left. So, but anyway, uh, there are obviously some literature in there in that aspect, which actually supports our simulations as well. So you have to keep on you finish. Yes, obviously. So and the, the question is that, okay, if you have a lithium on any kind of metal cation, like let's say lithium, sodium, potassium, then how does it kind of behave with the water? So we saw that, okay, there are different types of bonds kind of getting created. We saw that there is a creation of a metal ligand bond, a hydrogen bond, and there are different types of hydrogen bonds. Now, which of those hydrogen bonds are kind of playing the role with regards to uh, your swelling and uh, deweighting kind of characteristics? This is what we observed by doing this kind of simulation. So what I'm trying to get at is that we can utilize the chemistry type of things in order to uh, solve problems, which are purely engineering problems, in order to kind of do good things. Anyway, so I will come to the end of the slide in here. So basically, what we have talked about in here is that we talked about different types of materials that we have done. We talked about like metals, we talked about polymers, we talked about minerals and fluids. I did not talk anything about like propellants or energetic materials because usually that's a classified information. And we can talk about it at some length any other time. But anyway, so these type of materials we deal with. And when we're talking about like uh, different types of, I mean, uh, your extreme conditions, we can have different types of extremes as you can see in here. I talked about shock waves, pressures, temperature, not anything about the radiation. We also did some kind of like work with like ionizing radiations and non ionizing, ionizing radiations. They kind of like change the material structure and thereby the properties of it. And you might be thinking, okay, now what, I mean, where does all of them fit together? It's something like this. I do not know how many of you know about something called the Artemis mission. It's actually a mission by the NASA. And uh, what they are thinking about is basically creating a sustainable human habitat on the moon by the year 2030. So that's a pretty, not too much time, right? Now, when you're talking about like sustainable human environment, so this is a, this is a schematic. I mean, no one is going to build a glass atmosphere in here because the atmosphere that we're talking about in the moon is pretty significant. We have something like micrometeorite impacts, and those goes up to velocities of like 20 kilometers per second. Uh, so then we have like radiation environment because you have galactic cosmic radiations. So, and those are ionizing radiations, by the way, not like, not UV things. So that's one. Then we have like temperatures, which are like goes down to like 40 Kelvin. And then at, at the same day, so the diurnal temperature variation is like from, let's say 40 Kelvin to 400 Kelvin. So that's the diurnal variation. And then we have like vacuum atmosphere, gravity, low gravity. So all of these co things combined together makes it very difficult to kind of work or do a sustainable presence. You can go there, come back, that's a different domain. But if you want to kind of stay in there, that's a different, entirely a different scope. So uh, people are thinking about like, okay, utilizing the materials which are present within there. You, you, you do not want to kind of take cement from here and then kind of go and build on the moon, right? That's not feasible. So what you have to do is that you have to kind of take the lunar soil, let's say, and then use something in order to kind of come up with a kind of structure. So that's why we have taken something like lunar simulants. They've got some kind of lunar simulants from there. And with those lunar simulants, you're kind of like playing around, seeing that, okay, how, I mean, if you if you subject to like cosmic radiation, then how the material properties of those changes does, is there any kind of change in the chemical reactivity of those things? How can we tailor those things such that we can make at least this sustainable presence to some extent? By the way, Artemis mission, if you if you're interested, you can read through it. Uh, already there are like there will be like five Artemis missions. Already two of them are on schedule. One year behind, I guess. And they are planning something like 2030, there should be something like sustained human presence. I do not know. Nothing for us, but maybe for the future generation. Anyway, I think with, with that I will end. Uh, obviously, almost all the work has been done by my students, not me. So uh, they are all the PhD students that were graduated from my curriculum at one point of time or the other. And these are the funding instances from where I'm just going to continue to do the practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mitra, for the very nice talk. Uh, questions? Students first. 
Questions from the students? We asked a lot of questions. Yeah, there were lots of questions. Okay, what is it? What is it? We always have to lunch. Okay, see you later. Okay, for the online. Well, there's no one online actually. Okay, then I think I got it. Okay, so one question is that so I have heard of this phenomenon called sonoluminescence. Sonoluminescence, yes. Which happens when you apparently can strike water with very high pressure. Mm -hmm. you also study those kind of things? Yes, yes. Solar luminescence is an interesting property because what you're doing is that you are kind of inducing a mechanical pulse exactly. in order to create something which light is created for light. Exactly. So that means you'll be having some excited electrons. Right. Uh, yes, we do. Sure. But yes, I have not presented in here. That is one. The other would be, you said that this moon coil bricks were studying under cosmic radiation. Where are you getting the cosmic? Well, we, we uh, put it under like C60 radiation, I mean, cobalt 60 radiation. So that's a gamma radiation. Cosmic rays are cosmic radiations are gamma. Uh, these are gamma in the gamma ray category. Yes, they are in the gamma category. That's the best that you can have. Yeah. So you yes. mean uh, terrestrial sources? Yes. Are terrestrial obviously. cousins of cosmic. Yeah. Rays. So because I thought these uh, people have started using cosmic rays as X-rays to extrapolate them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.